Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bloomberg. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief here. My name is Peggy Collins. I really appreciate all of you in the room joining us today and those who will see it on air. Thank you for taking time for this very important event. I was actually in Manhattan on the morning of September 11, 2001 and will never forget myself. So I'm particularly honored to take part in today's 9-11 Memorial and Museum Summit presented by Fiserv. Bloomberg has proudly sponsored this event since its inception. For the past five years, it's actually been emceed by our colleague, Jason Kelly. As many of you know, our CEO, Mike Bloomberg, was sworn in as New York City's 108th mayor only a few months after the September 11th attacks. In the face of unimaginable loss and adversity, he helped lead New Yorkers through the Herculean task of rebuilding. As chairman of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum for more than 15 years now, Mayor Bloomberg ensured that where the Twin Towers once stood is now an awe-inspiring memorial to the nearly 3,000 people who lost their lives that morning. It has welcomed 60 million visitors, and there's also a world-class museum, which is focused increasingly on educating the more than 100 million young people who have been born since September 11, 2001. The 9-11 Memorial and Museum has also emerged as a vital convening space in which people can explore the issues of global security, counterterrorism, crisis leadership, and public service. With the goal of helping making our with the goal of helping to make our companies, cities, and nations safer, this annual summit on security fosters dialogue between public and private sectors on these issues and many more. 21 years after the 9-11 attacks, how we responded in those weeks and months after continues to inform and give context to the challenges we face today. That's why I am pleased to welcome two leaders in this field for a timely discussion on the current state of our national security. Please join me in welcoming White House Homeland Security Advisor, Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, and former Homeland Security Secretary, Jay Johnson, who is also a 9-11 Memorial and Museum trustee and partner, and a partner at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, LLP. Thank you both for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to you, Jay, for the discussion. Thank you very much. Welcome. I want to give a thank you to uh, Blumberg for hosting this, this event, this program. So it is a real honor for me to present this very rare opportunity to speak with someone who I've known for 14 years since the Bush to Obama transition. We were on the transition team together. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall is central to our homeland security, our national security. She is the president's homeland security advisor. Her por portfolio is very broad. It includes counterterrorism, cybersecurity, natural disasters, aviation security. I could go on and on and on and on. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Sherwood Randall is a native of Los Angeles, a graduate of Harvard College, a Rhodes Scholar. She got her doctorate from Oxford University. Um, fun fact, she and her younger brother are the very first in history <laughs> brother and sister team of Rhodes Scholars. No competition there, I'm quite sure. Uh, she has a doctorate in international relations. After her education, she went to work for then Senator Biden yes. in the 1980s on Capitol Hill. She was a deputy assistant secretary of defense during the Clinton years. And during the Obama administration, she served on various different positions in the national security staff, uh, more and more senior each position. And in 2014, she was appointed by the president to be deputy secretary of energy. Uh, for the last several years in private life, before the Biden administration, she was in academia, at the Kennedy School, at Georgia Tech. She's nodding her head, yes, that means I'm getting this right. And uh, she now serves as President Biden's Homeland Security Advisor. And as I, meant, as I said before, this is a rare opportunity to talk to somebody central to our national security and our homeland security. 
Dr. Sherwood Randall, thank you very much for doing this. So, um, my first question to you, which is a broad question, a very open-ended question, which a lot of people would typically ask me, um, is how do you evaluate today the terrorist threat to our, to our homeland, foreign-based or domestic-based? First of all, thank you. Um, I am honored to be here on this podium with you today, my friend, Secretary Johnson, Jay, who I have had the privilege of knowing professionally and also personally, as a friendship was forged in our service together in the Obama administration. And I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to speak today to this audience and those who will tune in, because it is a very important time for us to talk about these issues, the security of our homeland in the face of threats from abroad as well as threats within. So to answer your question about the current terrorist threat, I'll begin by saying that my role as Homeland Security Advisor was created in the wake of 9-11. There was not previously a Homeland Security Advisor at the White House. And uh, I live in an office that is in the uh, lower floor of the West Wing. It's basically a cave. I don't see the light. No <laughs> I leave before the sun comes up and I leave my office long after the sun goes down. And it's been kind of the nerve center of the counterterrorism enterprise at the White House uh, since that time, uh, with a brief period uh, in which there was no Homeland Security Advisor under the preceding administration. But I came into this role um, in January of 2021 and learned <coughs> immediately about two things. One is that the terrorist threat uh, for which we had prepared so effectively after 9-11 to build an entire infrastructure at home and around the world to prevent a major terrorist attack on the homeland from happening again, that terrorist threat had morphed and metastasized quite significantly. And so whereas it was uh, driven at, in 9-11 by al-Qaeda, uh, we had very uh, specific and vivid threat streams at the time that our intelligence community was able to identify and which we were able to disrupt. It has now evolved into a much more networked uh, set of organizations. Some of them are uh, related to one another. Some of them are rivalrous with one another. Um, and it spreads across the globe with the most significant um, evolution now being that there are, are significant swaths of territory in Africa that are held by ISIS and Al-Qaeda affiliated groups. So that uh, overseas creates a whole new set of challenges for us. In the homeland, of course, as you all know, we face a domestic terror threat that is uh, more significant than it has been before. And indeed, our intelligence communities, when they, uh, our leadership, when it goes up on the Hill to testify, uh, has noted that that presents a more immediate and direct threat to us than the groups do overseas. So we have had to spend a significant amount of time developing a new strategy for countering domestic terrorism, cognizant of the fact that our tools are very different in a democracy and where we want to be sure that the way we pursue our objectives on the domestic front in no way violate our norms or our, our laws or our values and that we continue to allow for freedom of expression and freedom of speech and at the same time address the challenge presented by those who believe that their political views can legitimately be expressed through violence, which is a big difference for us to see the evolution toward the use of violence as a means of achieving your political ends in this country. Obviously, responding to a homeland security threat from a foreign terrorist organization presents a very different set of challenges versus a domestic-based threat. Um, focusing just for a moment on the threat presented by foreign terrorist organizations. Let me, <clears throat> let me present you with a proposition and invite you to agree or disagree however you'd like. Um, because of our counterterrorism actions through multiple administrations, Bush, Obama, Trump, and now Biden, we have largely degraded and decapitated these organizations and because of our own reduced U.S. presence in those regions of the world that you referred to, the threat of 
foreign terrorist organizations attacking the U.S. homeland has been reduced. Would you, how would you respond to that proposition? I think in general I agree with that proposition, Jay. I'll, I'll uh, elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, we have had a great deal of success. Uh, the original charismatic leaders of many of the uh, groups have been taken off the battlefield, including by this administration. Mm -hmm. And so, as you know, we successfully uh, executed an over-the-horizon action against the head of al-Qaeda, who was um, harbor being harbored by the Taliban in Kabul. Uh, that was a very significant uh, achievement for our um, intelligence community and other operating agencies. We also have taken off the battlefield a number of leaders of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, including <clears throat> the Syrian Wali last summer. So we continue to pursue uh, uh, the leadership of these organizations where we can successfully do so, consistent with our values. And the president, President Biden's very high bar with respect to civilian casualties. That said, as I noted in describing the evolution of the terror threat, these groups are much more networked. And so the role of the original charismatic leader, like a, uh, an Osama bin Laden, is much less significant than it was 21 years ago. And so we have to do a lot of the work, which is like weeding the garden, uh, at the ground level with partner forces, where, which, who we train and enable, and continue to address uh, the growing challenge without necessarily um, having a singular leader to go after. And so that requires a different kind of work to, which we need to do, and work that um, I see importantly as being nested within a regional strategy that has to take account of all of the issues that are affecting communities and states in the region that will lead to the basically the petri dish that would allow terrorists to take hold. And so if you think about the challenges of failed governance, a lack of development, a lack of economic opportunity, the consequences of the pandemic, and potentially pernicious foreign actors as well, you can see why in some of the places in Africa, for example, in, in Central Africa, why we are seeing this spread and where if all we do is pursue counterterrorism, we will never effectively eradicate the threat. And what we have to do is work in an integrated way on governance and economic development <clears throat> and security mm -hmm. in order to achieve our objectives. You made a reference to over the horizon capability. Uh -huh. um, and there was a lot of debate around that with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And some argue that it's necessary to have a presence on the ground mm -hmm. in the places where we conduct these operations. Um, just spend a moment talking about what over the horizon capability is and how it's feasible. Right, well, first of all, I'll say you noted something very interesting. You noted uh, that your uh, assessment of the circumstances that we face includes the fact that we're not necessarily present in the places we used right. to be, and that creates less of a, um, uh, <clears throat> a magnet mm -hmm. for those who might be taking action to try to push us out. Mm -hmm. So that is a factor, and we aren't in Afghanistan anymore. Um, nevertheless, we saw the movement of the most senior al-Qaeda leader back to Afghanistan, and that was a, a, a um, a fundamental element of the agreement that was negotiated by the previous administration with the Taliban, that there should be no return of, of a foreign fighter presence in Afghanistan, um, no return of terrorist actors, no return of al-Qaeda. And so when we uh, developed the intelligence that confirmed to us that indeed this individual, Ayman al-Zawahiri, was resident in Kabul, uh, we were able to marshal the resources to execute an operation. How is that possible? It's because we have unique capabilities in the United States, because we maintain a presence around the world, because we train for these kinds of missions. Uh, you know you were the general counsel at the Department of Defense, what that training entails. It's rigorous. It's 
focused. It's, um, it is something we do out of the spotlight uh, and we cultivate uh, a capability in our special operations forces that is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, we have other agencies that do similar things and an intelligence community underlying it all, which is constantly watching and gathering information through both technical and human uh, sources. And so that enterprise has to remain vital and vigilant in order for us to continue right. to achieve those goals. And we, the president promised the nation and the world that in the withdrawal from Afghanistan, we would maintain that capability. And we continue to focus on ensuring that that is the case and that when we consider the scenarios we might face, that we have the force posture overseas to pursue those goals if we need to. Right. Um, how would you assess our, in the, in the counterterrorism space, how would you assess these days our intelligence capabilities? In the counterterrorism space? Yes. Ah, well, in the, um, in the space of uh, dealing with foreign terrorist threats, we have extraordinary capabilities. Mm -hmm. Our adversaries, uh, of course, are working to elude those capabilities, and so we have to continue to develop new ways of securing the information we need. For example, uh, the platforms that are used are increasingly encrypted, and that means that we have to figure out ways to get information that previously would have been more easily accessible. And that's a, a, a constant endeavor. It's why we invest in our science and technology enterprise across the federal government. When you were secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, you know that you had an s and enterprise, the Department of Defense does, the intelligence community, those are, that's crucial to us. That innovation machine is essential to our ability to keep acquiring the information we need to keep Americans at home and Americans and our allies and partners overseas secure. When it comes to the domestic dimension of terrorism, you're in a different space, obviously, because we have very clear laws governing what we can and cannot do with respect to Americans, and we are totally respectful of those laws. And we see a great deal of radicalization, unfortunately, taking place on open platforms uh, where young people spend time going into darker and darker places, mm -hmm. uh, driven by some of the algorithms and some of the social media com companies, um, uh, platforms that, that um, are interactive using AI, essentially seeing what someone's looking for and then responding and seducing right. uh, you into a place where you might find yourself uh, um, with others who may share similar views and who may prompt you to adopt additional uh, views that may not have been anything you initially thought about, but where if you're alone and isolated and, and uh, don't have the kind of um, opportunities that, that you had hoped for in your life, you may find this to be a, a good place to go. So that's a, that's a part of our work that is, very, is different. It's very challenging. It all has to be done at home uh, within the boundaries of our laws and our values. And our Department of Justice and our FBI and our intelligence community work with great rigor and discipline to ensure right. that what we're doing on the homeland front abides by all these norms. So um, before we turn to the domestic threat, uh, <clears throat> I will tell you when in 2002, Congress created the DNI and the whole new intelligence community yes. bureaucracy, I personally was a skeptic thinking, why do we need this additional layer of bureaucracy uh, to collect intelligence about foreign terrorist threats and so forth? And <clears throat> I've observed situations where that hasn't worked so well. Then we had very capable leaders uh, like Jim Clapper and now Avril Haines, who in my judgment is one of the most outstanding public servants of our time, uh, leading the intelligence community now. Um, is it structurally, is it working as well as it could, you think? I mean, you've got a lot of agencies in the alphabet soup. Sometimes they compete with one another. Sometimes they're cross currents. But are we, 
I'm asking you a leading question, obviously. It's, but a, are very, we it's a very good question. So first of all, we're never good enough at anything we do, in my judgment. We always have to keep improving. I mean, that's the nature of a democracy. It's not a static condition. We have to keep improving. In the federal enterprise, we have to keep improving. So we can look at it as a big innovation, which got after a fundamental problem that there was no integration of information across multiple intelligence agencies. And that, that led to some of the missed information that resulted in a catastrophe in our country. That integration is crucial, and it happens in a very dynamic and continuous way now. And it forces the intelligence community to do that work of hearing and learning from each other and of challenging each other's assumptions. Right. I don't want to see homogenized intelligence, actually. So I would say that when they compete, I like it because right. I'm interested in hearing diverse perspectives. That does the defense the intelligence... The majority and dissenting views. The majority and dissenting views. Or does the defense intelligence agency see a threat differently from the central intelligence agency? Does the energy department have mm -hmm. information from its laboratories that's different from another group uh, that, of analysts? And why is that? And that helps us to be more rigorous because often there isn't one... Simple answer, it's complex, and you have to weight the information. So that kind of um, deliberate effort to bring the community together around a table and to provide the diverse views, I think, is essential to our being better. I will also say that operationally, we depend heavily on that community. So for example, in the work we do on screening and vetting, mm -hmm. when we think about who should come to our shores and who should not be allowed to come to our shores, that collection of information and the different perspectives of the agencies is also essential to us, to our security uh, from that perspective. So I see it as being always a work in progress, and we are much better for it. It, it, it took me a while to figure this out when I was secretary, that I could actually do this. But occasionally, in reading the daily intelligence, I'd read a report from an intelligence agency, and then there'd be a dissent. Yes. From another intelligence yes. agency. And I finally said to my intelligence briefer, well, I'd like to read the, I'd like to meet the analyst who wrote this, and I'd like to meet the analyst who wrote that. Are you serious? You really? I, Tom Warwick will remember this. And so, like a couple of days later, these two analysts would show up at my, in my skiff, a little shocked. Trembling, I'm trembling, sure. Right. <laughs> And I would ask them, okay, why did you conclude what you concluded? Why did you conclude what you concluded? And very often, what would come out of that was that there was not a whole lot of difference. There might have been a difference in emphasis mm -hmm. or outlook, but objective. Nuance, nuance. But it added rigor to the mm -hmm. process and certainly heightened my own understanding. So I'm quite sure every once in a while- I do that some frequently. Some analyst get a call, gets a call from Dr. Sherwood Randall's office to come you know, discuss yes. the report. And another thing I often do is <clears throat> when I get a really interesting written report, it may not include a dissent, but it will, there will, it will reflect an enormous amount of work. I'm interested in knowing what lies behind it, what didn't get included right. in the writing, what are the origins of some of these um, uh, conclusions that were reached, and I'll gather the people who wrote it. I'll also say I do that with journalists. So if I see a phenomenal piece, for example, the Washington Post did an extraordinary report um, after January 6th, mm -hmm. a, a big uh, section of the Sunday paper on, on what happened on January 6th. And I actually asked the key members of the team who wrote it to come in and meet with me to talk with me. They were also very surprised by that. I was right. extremely interested in understanding how they did the reporting, how they arrived at their conclusions. I mean, I think this should be a conversation among us. There is no one truth. We have to keep learning. We have to keep probing our assumptions. We have to keep growing what we know. And the world is changing constantly. Right. And so it's especially true when you're in a very senior role in government as you were you can easily be in a bubble, surrounded by people who are afraid to tell you things, because often they, right. they're they concerned that if they give you bad news, it will make you unhappy, so whereas... Sure. I never did that with reporters, except maybe to call one of them and scream at them. Really? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my motto in my role, and it's, of course, associated with the kind of work I have to do to prevent bad things from happening, is bad news does not get better with age. So I would much rather hear what is not good than be told everything is fine. Because if I'm told something's not good, I have a chance to get after it. If I don't know until it blows up, then we've missed the opportunity. I, I once heard our mutual friend, Dennis McDonough, say that 
Good news is on the express. Bad news <laughs> is on the local, making every single stop before yeah. it gets to you. Well, and I think you have to commit, create as a leader a, what the Department of Defense would describe as a command climate in which you welcome divergent views and you welcome people to surface <clears throat> concerns. At the Department of Energy, for example, we had to reinforce our whistleblower protections because what we were seeing was people were afraid to surface mm -hmm. Things that they could see in, in this vast and dispersed organization that is the Department of Energy, they could see where they were working, that there were things that were really high risk and people right. weren't getting after them. And so we had <clears> to say, it's safe for you to be a whistleblower. It's safe for you to come and tell me that something is a problem. I'd like to hear the facts and then we have a chance to get after it. So let's turn to the threat of domestic terrorism. The uh, Anti-Defamation League and others have for a while now, tracked terrorist attacks, things that are considered terrorist attacks in this country, and has noted that domestic-based terrorism now outpaces acts of terrorists coming from forest ter foreign terrorist organizations. Yes. Um, the Department of Homeland Security, as you know, was created in 2002, really on the assumption that the terrorist threat to our homeland was extraterritorial, mm -hmm. and therefore, let's consolidate into one cabinet-level department the regulation of all the different ways somebody can enter this country, land, sea, and air, and hopefully we'll have dealt with terrorism. Now that it's principally domestic-based, there are not a whole lot of DHS cops running around the interior looking for terrorists, and so to a large extent, as you've noted, this falls to the FBI. Are we, in your observation, adequately equipped now to deal with the current threat environment? So we are growing our capacity as we work through the challenges of doing this in a democracy. And I will say first that your own department, your former department, plays a very significant role in prevention. Uh, we'll start with the the there, the way I've thought through how to get after this in three buckets. One is we need to do a much better job of getting information uh, out to those who need to know about what is happening. So that requires acquiring the information, um, information and intelligence about the challenges we face, and sharing it across all the law enforcement entities that would need to know about it. That wasn't happening as well as it needed to. So we have made a big commitment to ensuring that we do a much more um, agile and proactive job of gathering and sharing information about what we're seeing in the domestic terrorist landscape. Second, we have to do much more on the prevention front. And I alluded previously to the, the it's kind of a stereotype of a, a young person who feels isolated um, alienated, can't find meaningful work, and is being radicalized online. We saw during COVID that this was something that was unfortunately happening to a lot of young people. <clears throat> and they are seduced in dark places to think that there may be a better future in violence. We see this in a number of the uh, violent attacks that have happened in the homeland in the last two years, uh, and uh, whether it's in Buffalo or in Uvalde. Uh, and so we know that we must do a much better job on the prevention front, front, beginning with how we help those who are either family members or colleagues of individuals who they see beginning to radicalize, how we can get those people help. This is one person at a time. We don't have large groups that are organized. We're seeing largely lone wolves. Some are in in some organizations, but mostly this is really about getting after the problem of human beings who are, who are feeling so out of sync with what is happening around them and who develop the notion that the only way to express themselves and perhaps validate themselves is to use violence. So that prevention piece is a big piece of business and DHS is in the lead on it with significant programs largely focused on support to communities to work on, on, on preventing <clears throat> um, radicalization to violence by Americans. Second, and third, the third element is, so first is the information sharing, second is prevention, third is what we do to disrupt. How do we actually prevent things from happening if there's already been movement to take, 
to use violence? And how do we develop a consequence regime sufficient to deter people from using violence? And that really is the job of the Department of Justice and the FBI, doing extensive work on this front. And Chris Ray has testified that he now has as many open cases of domestic terrorism as he does against foreign terrorist actors. So we know that there is real work being done uh, to try to establish mm -hmm. uh, the consequence regime that will be necessary. We need to do the healing, too, that I think is being done now when we see the outcome of this election. And uh, the, the um, uh, I don't want to speak politically, but I will say I think that seeing that those who were election deniers have largely not succeeded in securing uh, elected positions. It confirms that Americans recognize that this is who we are, that we are a country that expresses our political views through the ballot box, not through bullets, and that in order to continue to lead the world and to be the country that we, we cherish, we have to uphold that sacred right, which is to vote and then to have a peaceful transition of power. And um, we can feel undergirding that the enormous work that was done to secure this election season in mm -hmm. 2022, which goes back to the beginning of our administration, the work of DHS, uh, the work of the Department of Justice, the work of the FBI. How do you uh, evaluate now the work that's been done since 2016 on our election infrastructure? So since 2016, there has been a great deal of work by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the acronym for those who don't know it is CISA, which is under your leadership at DHS. And uh, for this election, uh, CISA was very substantially involved in working with our state and local partners on both the physical and cyber security of our election infrastructure. And the focus of their work was to harden the infrastructure against the possibility of physical or cyber attacks or combined attacks that could be from foreign actors or domestic actors. And so that has been uh, thus far uh, from the evidence that we are seeing from this election cycle successful. Right. But we must remain ever vigilant. It was largely successful in 2020. I mean, the percentage incidents of voter fraud, theft, the nearest round number is probably zero. I mean, we have to really look at the, <clears throat> uh, the courage and the patriotism of the people who do this work. There were a number of threats to those who were uh, working in, a, in the uh, polling places and in the tabulation facilities. And when I'm sure some of you, especially journalists, have seen them uh, speaking on the news, they're incredibly courageous people, and they're just doing their job in the face of, of people who have accused them of things that um, are are inconsistent with the role they are playing, and they have persisted on the grounds that, again, this is who we have to be as Americans if our country is going to survive. Right. What, um, Liz, what role do you think the government should have or not have when it comes to disinformation in media, social media, uh, and combating that? We do need to shine a light on disinformation. We're in an environment in which that's very difficult. And I will say, given that we're at Bloomberg, this is a, a role for journalists, importantly, to play in, in calling out what is true and what is untrue, uh, in being rigorous about that and hewing to the facts and informing your audiences. That's a fundamental role in a democracy that the media has to play. We unfortunately live in an environment in which not all media members see that as their responsibility, but that is a job for all of us. And in government, we have the same obligation to um, identify where there is significant misinformation being promulgated and to address it. And we see it coming from foreign actors and we see it in the domestic space as well. It's much more challenging domestically, just as we've been discussing uh, in, in describing the constraints we face in getting after um, domestic terrorism. We have to be sure that we are not in any way violating people's First Amendment rights. Right. Um, and so it is complex. 
uh, as a challenge, but one that we have to uh, pursue. A good example is that we're seeing... Um, Without getting into the business of government censorship. Well, but that is the risk, and that is why we have to do this in a way that is so careful. And um, a good example for you is that we are seeing uh, the uh, reach of foreign governments into some of our academic institutions seeking to manipulate uh, students who they are funding, intimidating students who are not abiding by their guidance. That's the kind of thing that we do have the capacity to do, working in partnership with academic institutions to illuminate for them what's happening on their campuses to ensure that they're providing the kind of security that the students on their campuses need. It's a complex challenge, mm -hmm. and one we, we will have to uh, continue to develop means of addressing, again, consistent with those values of not impeding people's rights of free speech. Unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, oh, yes. um, present a public safety challenge, a growing public safety challenge. Yes. And I know that the Biden administration has taken steps to address this. Could you talk about that? Yes, this is something I've been very focused on because we have seen overseas the pernicious use of drones and the growing threat that drone, drones present to a number of our facilities around the world. And so when I came into office and I uh, brought with me the experience that I'd had in the Department of Energy where we were seeing the threats that drones presented to some of our national security facilities in the homeland, I asked the question, what kinds of authorities do we have? What has happened since I left office in, in early January 2017? Do we have the authorities we need at the federal, state, and local level to ensure that we can um, uh, appropriately interdict, first of all, identify and then interdict threats? And the answer is we do not. So the agencies that have some capacity are the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense, the, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice. Some of those authorities uh, at the federal level are actually expiring. Uh, the DHS and DOJ FBI authorities are expiring. And we've asked Congress to um, sustain those authorities so that the federal agencies can provide security, support on countering UAS at events like the Super Bowl. Uh, so we're thinking about the ways in which you can imagine major uh, public events that gather a lot of people where a terrorist actor or some other individual who wants to do harm could be using an unmanned aerial system inappropriately. Uh, we also put forward to Congress a proposal to expand the authorities of state and local law enforcement to use drones, to counter drones under very specific circumstances, to use capabilities that would be identified by the federal government as appropriate to these uh, circumstances so that they could interdict uh, at the state and local level threats that they may face. That legislation was put before Congress earlier this year. Thus far, Congress has not approved that legislation, and we continue to advocate for it on the grounds that this is a threat coming our way, Americans are going to be at risk, and we need to develop a whole ecosystem consistent with our laws, consistent with our values that enables federal, state, and local law enforcement to identify and interdict the use of hostile unmanned aerial systems. In the absence of congressional action, we are also taking every step that we can in the federal government. And so we have developed an approach in which we are um, increasing our work to integrate federal research and development of the technologies that are needed to counter drones, particularly non-kinetically, because that would be most successful uh, in the domestic context. We are working to develop a list of approved uh, technologies that can be acquired by federal, state, and local entities once the authorities are granted to those state and local entities. And finally, we're establishing a federal training center so that we can train law enforcement at the federal, state, and local level on the use of these technologies to counter drones. Again, we have to get out after this. It's coming our way, and we can't put our head in the sand about it. I remember taking this issue on when I was in office, just for the national capital region. Yes. Incredibly complex. Do you remember why? Airspace. Do you remember? Jurisdictions, multiple jurisdictions. I convened a meeting of everybody who had a stake, and it must have been 12 different law enforcement agencies, including the Department of Transportation. It was an incredibly complicated 
picture just here in this town. And Secretary Johnson, I have to remind you of something that happened at my home. You came for brunch at my home when my high school age son had saved up all his allowance and had purchased a drone at a hobby shop out in uh, Four Corners. And um, he was flying the drone up above our home when your security detail arrived. And they required that he down that drone. <laughs> And he was quite mortified by this. But the, the, the point of this was that we were in a moment when we were just figuring out the threat that was being presented in the national capital region by the fact that anybody could go out and buy one of these right. basically toy drones, mm -hmm. but you could use them for pernicious purposes. Right. It was evident to us. And you took the action to figure out what needed to be done Holistically, motivated in the by your capital sons. region, right. one of the many motivations, I'm sure. <clears throat> but he continues to um, have that that drone capability, yeah. albeit only for the hobby purposes, not for. <laughs> you know, you reminded me. I ones. was giving a commencement address in Florida when I was in office, and all of a sudden, this drone starts buzzing over my head, uh -huh. which made the Secret Service a little anxious. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's a work in progress, but you're doing your best to address it. Don't count on Congress to, uh, to not allow an authority to lapse, by the way. To we are working that mm. very uh, actively. I would be grateful for those who care about it to uh, raise their voices, because mm -hmm. we are very concerned about the lapsing of the authorities. The DOD authority doesn't lapse as soon, but the <coughs> Department of Homeland Security and DOJ slash FBI authority will sunset this year if, it's right. not, if there is not a clean reauthorization. <coughs> of that authority. So it's an important one for our security in the homeland. So in the few minutes we have left, left let me just take on the very quaint, small subject of cybersecurity, uh, which is also part of your vast portfolio. Um, it's in general terms, how do you rate the current cyber threat to our homeland? I'll begin by saying, as you know, when we came into office, the Homeland Security uh, Advisor uh, had a, a partner for the first time in doing cybersecurity in the National Security Council. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, appointed Ann Neuberger as the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technologies. And Ann has done an extraordinary job working in partnership with me on identifying the ways in which we can strengthen the cybersecurity of our critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that critical infrastructure work is focused on the combination of cyber and physical security improvements that have to take place across the 16 critical infrastructure sectors. This is work that will frankly never be done. So we always will have more to do. But for the first time, we're really getting after the question of how do we identify the authorities that exist, and therefore the gaps that exist in setting standards for all of these sectors in cybersecurity and in physical security. We saw this, for example, with the um, Colonial Pipeline attack, which was a ransomware attack, but which resulted in the shutdown of the pipeline and significant consequences for access mm -hmm. to fuel mm -hmm. supply. Uh, in the affected regions, because the Colonial Pipeline is like a jugular vein uh, to the south and northeast. And in that event, it demonstrated that, that connection between cyber and physical effects and why it's so important for us to consider them in a combined fashion. So Anne and I lead this effort across these um, sectors, and the work is ongoing, and it depends heavily on the investments of our private sector partners. You know this so well from our work together when I was at the Energy Department. We had to ask the energy sector to step up with us in investing in cyber and physical security of the grid because 90 plus percent of the infrastructure is in private hands. And the energy sector as the lifeline sector for our nation really got out ahead. It has paced the other industries in setting those standards and investing in that security. We now have to do that in multiple additional sectors and that work is underway. What um, message do you want those in the private sector in critical infrastructure to most here? that you have to diagnose your entire system, 
you have to know what is on all your networks mm -hmm. and identify the nodes of risk. And then you need to invest in hardening those nodes. So for example, industrial control systems are vulnerable and you need to be investing the technologies that allow you to see where you have threats on your systems and you need to prevent those threats from disrupting your operations. Mm -hmm. And you'll need to do that in partnership with some of the um, federal partners who've made themselves available to you, as well as with some of the um, companies that have grown up around this space to provide the capabilities. And if you think you are going to avoid this threat, you will not. So it will be far better to make the up investment upfront in security mm -hmm. than to have to recover from what will come your way if you do not. Um, do you think that the um, most sophisticated in critical infrastructure, financial services, defense industrial base, do you think they are where they should be now? No. Truthfully, again, I, it, it, it is, uh, maybe a good analogy would be uh, our aging bodies. In order to stay strong, stay strong as we get older, we actually have to do more exercise, not less. The truth is we have to keep doing more in this space because what happens is as we harden our systems, our adversaries will develop new ways of getting around that. So then we have to get stronger and then we have to look at the new ways in which they're going to get around that and then we have to get stronger. So this is work without end. Mm -hmm. it's, it is why some of us choose to continue to do work in, in federal government as hard as it is because we want to keep making our nation stronger and safer. And the only way to do that is to keep investing in these improvements. Um, you mentioned Colonial Pipeline. It was one ransomware attack, as I recall, that had far-reaching consequences. Yes, yes. What lessons should we learn from that? So there are a variety of lessons from the Colonial Pipeline. I think one is that companies need to exercise rigorously for multi-dimensional cascading effects of a single attack. So you may have a ransomware attack, but what you didn't think about was the fact that that would be on your IT systems. But in order to prevent something from happening, which could be more pernicious, you, your operators would close, shut down your operational systems, your OT systems. And then you have a much greater challenge because you haven't ever thought through what it would take to bring that up back up to speed quickly. So thinking through the whole ecosystem of your operation and what will happen under various scenarios and then exercising for them and identifying the gaps and preparing to close those gaps is essential across all of these sectors. And what we are doing in the federal landscape through the work that DHS does uh, with all of the uh, sectors and the sector-specific agencies is asking our private sector partners to do that work with us. Right. Um, so we could talk about natural disasters, the threat of climate Another change, big piece global of business warming. For us, That's yes. also something on your plate. It is. Um, how's FEMA doing? FEMA is working overtime. FEMA has got so much on its plate from continuing to do the work it did during the, the COVID response to helping communities rebuild all across our country from extreme weather events that have devastated them, whether Florida most recently, Puerto Rico, California, Louisiana, Colorado. Our country has never experienced the scale of extreme weather events that we have experienced uh, in the last few years. And the consequence is we have more devastation in communities uh, that need more help over the long term than we have ever seen before. Um, and we are going to have to build the capacity to sustain that level of effort as a nation to help co our communities recover. And in addition, we're going to have to invest in resilience so that communities have less recovery to do given what is coming our way. And that's really my focus now is on ensuring that we take the major investments in infrastructure that have become available to us through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Recovery Act and use that money to invest in new building that is resilient against the kinds of threats that we face, whether it's extreme weather threats or threats from pernicious adversaries. So it's the all hazards threats that we need to uh, build our new infrastructure, our new roads, our new bridges, our new buildings, our new houses 
to be able to withstand. And that will help reduce the impacts of these extreme weather events going forward, because we know we are not going to stop them from happening. And the pace of our work against climate change is not meeting the challenge that climate change is presenting to us. Um, Liz, if you could roll the clock back, and this is a difficult question, different administration, different time. Uh, if you could roll the clock back to March 2020, just as COVID was breaking out here in the US, um, what, um, what role could FEMA have played more effectively in that crisis? I think FEMA did heroic work during that crisis. I think what you needed in March 2020 was respect for science. This goes back to your point about, your question about disinformation. Mm -hmm. When you have mm -hmm. the most senior people, the most senior person in the country defying the science, it's confusing to people. It's profoundly confusing. People actually listen to a president. A president's words have consequences. And so to me, the most important thing that could have happened in March of 2020 was that we would have had leadership that spoke the truth about what the science was telling us and which asked people to take the actions necessary to save our healthcare workers and to save lives in our communities. Mm -hmm. And going forward, that's what we have to do. We have to uplift the science, honor the truth tellers, respect our healthcare workers in a pandemic situation, invest in the capabilities that will enable us to do that going forward, um, and uh, support FEMA in its work which is responding to the desperate needs of communities across this country in so many difficult circumstances. In my experience, um, when I was secretary of DHS, <clears throat> and I had to communicate publicly about a problem, a threat, I tried to first be very honest and straightforward about, here's the threat, here's the problem that we face, here are the 10 things that your government is doing about it, and here's what we need from you. And in my experience, when you're honest and candid in straightforward language, taking out the bureaucratic ease and the way lawyers like yes. to write, I'm a lawyer, um, people will generally respond. It's also the case that sometimes you have to repeat yourself 18 times before the Washington Post or the New York Times or whatever will will pick it up. But do you, in the in the current environment, and you've talked about disinformation, um, what is your sense for the mood of the American public for absorbing bad news? I think we have to continue to explain why things are the way they are and what we can do to make them better. So you just described offering facts and then also offering a way forward. It's important to, to tell the truth and it may be bad and also to say this is what we're doing about it. And not to, not to uh, over promise, to actually say it may take time. This is true in the emergency response space for sure, which is that we have to say you may not have power for this number of days. It will take this long to be able to restore access to this location because the roads are out. We're going to try to get uh, emergency supplies in as quickly as possible, but it may be safer for you to leave rather than to stay. We have to tell the truth and ask people to listen. We saw in Florida, some people were not willing to heed the evacuation orders from their state and local officials. And as a consequence, they were in dire circumstances. Then that puts a burden on our capabilities to come in and rescue them. It puts our people at risk, but we do it. We had the Coast Guard, the DHS oversees the Coast Guard, as you know. Coast Guard was out there before dawn, after the hurricane blew through Florida, rescuing <coughs> hundreds of people mm -hmm. from some of those barrier islands where they had refused to evacuate and who were now not able to uh, make it if they were not helped. So we try our best and then we have to figure out what to do uh, in the aftermath. And uh, I think the only way we can accomplish this goal is to continue to establish credibility by speaking truth uh, and to try to develop a connection with 
with the American people in understanding that we're doing it in a way that is genuinely in support of their interests. I'm going to, in the final few minutes we have, veer toward the semi-personal. So <clears throat> a big part of your job is bringing the president bad news or bringing the president things he doesn't want to hear, problems he'd rather not have to grapple with at that moment. Um, others in your role have described it as the job of being the Grim Reaper <laughs> um, because you're bringing problems mm. to the boss. What, um, in your experience in the job now, which is almost two years, what's a good day for you in the West Wing? Every day is a good day in the West Wing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a privilege to serve. I feel thankful for the opportunity. I say that honestly, you know me well. Uh, a good day is, is when I'm able to bring solutions to problems to the president. Uh, and I work really hard to do that. I was trained in an early role that you described when I was a deputy assistant secretary at the Defense Department. I was in my early 30s. And the secretary of defense was William Perry, who's still alive. He's in his mid-90s. And I remember coming to him very early in my tenure and describing a big problem. And he looked at me somewhat quizzically and said to me, Liz, you should never come to me and just dump a problem in my lap. You should come to me with several options identified for solving the problem. Right. I was really embarrassed by that and vowed not to do that again. And I do really take that to heart. That is, we see terrible things happening. My job is to figure out what to do about them mm -hmm. and how to improve upon things that cannot necessarily be solved, but which can be better managed. Because there are problems which we will, we will never uh, be able to say that's done, and, but there are ways in which we can handle it in a way that reduces the threat to the homeland, the risks to the American people, the pain to human beings, the suffering of human beings. So those are the things that I spend a lot of time doing is figuring out solutions and working with people in the White House and the team across the federal enterprise and in states and in communities and overseas as well to try to bring about some of those positive changes that will lead to better outcomes. So you, you have devoted your career at DOD, Energy, White House, Capitol Hill, to public service. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? It comes from being brought up in a family in which I was um, challenged by my parents to find a way to contribute to making the world a better place with my one and only life. And uh, they're not on this planet anymore, but it was deeply ingrained in me that I needed to choose a path to service. And I believe in it profoundly. It's, it's hard, it's, um, it's risky. Um, it's, it's at this level of service, it is, um, it is relentless. And I feel that when I wake up in the morning, uh, I have the chance to make a difference, and that, as I said, is a huge privilege. Do you have any concern about uh, recruiting the next generation of Liz Sherwood Randalls? I've made it a, a, a priority to inspire and motivate young people to service. There are many ways in which you can serve, mm -hmm. of course, at the in <clears throat> government, in in, um, in non-governmental organizations, in international institutions, in the private sector, you can find ways. In medicine, um, you can serve. In There are so many ways to serve, so I would not say it's exclusive to government. But I do try to inspire young people through my work in the academic institutions in which I've spent time, as you noted, and in my mentorship of many young people throughout my time in government to think about ways that they can use their life to make a difference uh, in, in a project that is larger than themselves, not just about their own comfort, um, but about trying to, to address problems that, that are beyond their own immediate um, security. And uh, I find that there are an enormous number of young people who really do want to serve, who, who choose to um, go down that hard path, and I try in every way I can to open doors for them and help them. Last question. Um, 
the audience for this program uh, are people around the 9-11 Memorial Museum, members, victims' families, mm -hmm. families of those who died on September 11, 2001, um, and the larger community concerned about our homeland security in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, what would you what would you like to say in a concluding comment to this audience on behalf of yourself, the president you work for, and his administration? Well, we hold your loss in our hearts. I know the president does. I certainly do. We work 24-7 to bring justice to those who've done us harm and to prevent future attacks that would cause such loss again to Americans and to our allies and partners. We are stronger for the experience that we have had together because often tragedy makes us stronger and we can never give up this fight. And that is certainly the commitment of this administration. Uh, and so for the families uh, of, of those who were lost on 9-11 and for all the first responders um, who gave their lives as well um, and have worked subsequently to prevent uh, future terrorist acts, I'm grateful. Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, thank you for your time with us. We know it's precious. Thank you, Jay. Uh, just a quick note of thanks. Thank you to thanks to you both for your service and for um, <clears throat> persevering uh, on the challenges of our national security. For those of you in the audience and on screen, I just want to mention that if you want more information about the 9-11 Memorial and Museum and particularly on the Summit for Security and the further programming around it, you can go to 911memorial.org slash summit. That's 911memorial.org slash summit. And thank you again.